This is a special report from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. Welcome back to our continuing coverage of the trial of Scott Peterson, the Parkland School Resource Officer. Let's go to the courtroom for segment number three of today. I'll show you what's now in evidence as States 21. So, Mr. Sibley, if you could please play that for us. And this would, yeah, this would not be. Yeah, court deputy, none of the televisions are on, correct? Oh, Bro, what? The, I know you. I know you guys hear me. Now I'm going behind the cover. It's not like somebody in the bathroom. Shh. Oh, oh, like it doesn't, right? Yeah. What the fuck? We've already discussed the afternoon when that was. Uh, that's indicative of what time in the afternoon that was? That was um, probably around 2, like a little after 2.20. So that was after we heard the first set of like popping sounds. So we heard them. We sort of stopped for a second trying to figure out what it was. And then um, I think it was like right right before, I think during that video, the second set of popping sounds were happening. I think I couldn't hear it in the video, but I just remember that the first set kind of caused us to pause, you know? And then um, we heard a noise that, uh, that elicited some screams from students. That, right. Was that noise? Yeah. Um, well, the noise, the noise, it was the, um, the fire alarm, the alert that went off. And I think everybody was just sort of on edge. And that moment, like right before the fire alarm went off, uh, because we were trying to figure out what the noise was. So the fact the fire alarm went off and it's so loud, it's so piercing that it just sort of jolts you every time it goes off. You know, I just remember being in that building. Anytime the fire alarm would go off, it just sort of startles you, you know. So I think everyone was sort of on edge. And then I think that's why everybody was screaming. Okay. And um, do, do you recall or not whether or not that fire alarm went off? Uh, the shuttle uh, after coming on. It was, it stayed on for, I don't know how long, maybe a minute, 45 seconds, a minute, which is also unusual because normally it would, it would go on for a while. But the alarm was going off as we were uh, evacuating the classroom. And it, I don't remember when it went off. Uh, I don't remember if I heard gunshots and the alarm at the same time. Well, let me ask you that. This is a, a quick question about normal procedure. Uh, if that alarm goes off, is it normal procedure to immediately start evacuating, or do you wait for uh, anything to come over? Do no. you have a PA system? We do have a PA system, but the protocol then was exit immediately. Okay. Don't. There was never an announcement ever. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, let me ask you further. Did you ever hear an announcement come over any the speaker of a code red that day? No. May I approach the witness? You may. Um, could you please take a look at what's in Martin States V and tell me if you recognize that diagram? Yeah, that's the um, the diagram of the third floor of the 1200 building. Okay. And your classroom number again was? 1255. All right. And does that accurately and fairly depict uh, the diagram accurately, accurately and fairly depict the layout of the, 12, the third floor of the 1200 building? Yes. Judge, at this time, the state would ask to move state B into evidence. Any objection? No objections. Without objection, states B for identification will now be in evidence at a state's exhibit 22. And if the court, if I could uh, use the Elmo to publish, there's nothing sensitive. The TVs can be on for this. Yes. Okay. And Judge, would you mind if we put on the pencil and the, the marker, please?
one second. Thank you. Doing the same thing. I can't just point. It's no problem. Okay, you sure. I can. Sorry about that. No problem. No problem. Um, Miss Lapel, again, I, you just said a few moments ago it was classroom 1255, so I'm going to use my finger here and point to 1255. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And would um, Mr. Beagle's classroom be 1256? Yes. Right next door. All right. And this, as you see over here, would be the east stairwell. Yes. All right, and coming over here to this side, this would be the west stairwell. Yes. Do you know what, what, what's in this area right up above my finger there? That's the teacher's lounge. Okay. And um, with the numbering, can you tell, is, is there a number assigned to where the bathrooms are? Oh, for the, the students' restrooms? Yeah, yeah, 1247 and 1248. Okay, those are the restrooms. Um, I'll... Trying to use my finger here. Okay, 1247 and 1248. Those would be uh, the restrooms? Yes. And um, do you remember when you were evacuating, you said that you did see um, a meadow and another girl uh, lying on the ground. Where on this photograph uh, or on this um, depiction that would have been? Yes, they were in front of 1249 and 1250. Okay, so in here in this in the, area? In the alcove, in the alcove. Uh, that's between, there's a little partition there. Okay. And um, I believe you also said that you saw Joaquin? Yes. And where was, where was Joaquin? In 1247. Okay, the... Men's room, 1247. Yes. Okay. All right. I believe you also said you saw Peter Wang. Where yes. Was he? he was at the very end of the um, of the hallway, all the way on the west side, okay. against the wall. So would that sort of be between the entrance to the teacher's lounge and the entrance to the uh, west stairwell? Yes. And if I, am I pointing in basically That's correct. the right yes. direction? Okay. Um. I believe you also testified earlier that um, Jamie Guttenberg, uh, you found out later she had been moved, but at one point she was, do you remember where? She was like where 1200A is Okay. from what I, I didn't see it. I didn't see her, but I, I, I heard that that's where she was. On the landing sort of out, Correct. out here. Okay. Thank you. Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. Uh, Ms. LaPelle, I want to show you what's been marked as State's W for identification. Um, this is a composite of six pictures. Could you just to yourself quickly look through them and see if you recognize that these are the pictures you looked at earlier today? Do you recognize every one of those pictures? I do. Do they fairly and accurately represent the people that are in those pictures? Yes. And you know who those persons are? Yes. At this time, Judge, I'd like to move State's composite um, W into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Without objection, State's W for identification will now be in evidence. That is State's Exhibit 23, a composite exhibit of six photos. And with the court's permission, I would like to publish, please. You may. Uh, 
Ms. Lapel, can you please tell us um, what we're looking at in this photograph? That is Meadow Pollock. Okay. And was Meadow one of your students? She was. And it, you already stated that you saw her at the, uh, after the incident. I did. In the hallway. Correct. She had yes. Been shot. Uh, do you recognize the photograph that is currently being displayed? That's Peter Wang. And um, Peter was the one you just told the, the jury a few moments ago was at the end of the hallway between the teacher's lounge and the uh, doors to the west stairwell. Yes. And he had been shot. Did yes. You hear? Yes. And Ms. Lapel, do you recognize um, the person depicted in this picture? That's Kara Lochran. And uh, again, um, did you see Carol Laughlin after you left your classroom? I did. And which had she been shot? Yes. And Ms. Lepel, do you recognize the person in this photograph? That's Jamie Guttenberg. All right. And we went through that, that you did not see her but you had learned later on that she was on the landing at the floor west there. Correct. And Ms. Lapel, do you recognize <clears throat> the person in this picture? That's Scott Beagle. And um, he was the teacher in the classroom next door, correct? Yes. And you saw that he had been hit by gunfire when he left? Yes. In the classroom. I did. And I have one last photograph. Do you recognize who's in that photograph? That's Joaquin Oliver. Is Joaquin in your class? Yes. As was Meadow? Correct. And you saw Joaquin when you left your classroom? I did. And he had been shot? Yes. Church, at this time, I do have, would like to show the witness what is already in evidence as state six. It's a composite, and it would be, sir, F4 from that composite. You want to play F4 of State's Exhibit 6, which is the camera labeled number 23? Yes, sir. Is that correct? Okay. You may proceed. Thank you. Oh, and this, yeah, this would be sensitive. Understood. Yes. Court Deputy Unit, please let me know when all the TVs are on. Okay. Very good. You may proceed. Ms. Lopez, that, that yellow uh, circle, is that going around you, where you are located? Yes, that's me. <clears throat> Thank you.
thank you. And that very last scene, um, that's you and just opposite from you is Scott Eagle. Yes. Thank you very much. Mr. Clear, are you done with the I, I, examination? Just one last thing. Court, allow me. I just wanted to ask um, the photographs that I showed you earlier, the light photographs of the six people, uh, they were all on the third floor, correct? Correct. Okay. okay. Cross examination, you may proceed. Ms. Lapel, I'm so sorry that you went through this trauma. I'm going to try to get you off as quickly as possible. The sounds that you heard were muffled, popping sounds, correct? Correct. At no point did you or anyone around you seem to think these were gunfire shots, correct? No one around me directly, correct. And that was the first round of gunfire that you hear, correct? You thought they were muffled, popping sounds? It sounded like popping sounds, like balloons popping or firecrackers. And the other example you gave is like a cart going over cement? Yes. Okay. But definitely not gunfire, correct? Would not be a context for me at that moment. And you believe that those shots were coming from outside of yes. the 1200 building, correct? That is correct. And you believed that it was between somewhere the 1200 building and the 700 building outside, correct? That's what I thought. And then the second round of gunfire occurred, correct? The second popping sounds, I assumed, was coming from the same location. And it was the same type of muffled popping sound, yes. correct? Yes. Not like gunfire, correct? That's correct. And you also believe that it wasn't coming from inside the 1200 building, but outside the 1200 building, correct? Yes. And you even thought that it was coming from somewhere between the 700 building and the 1200 building outside, correct? Yes. You never obviously would have let your students go onto the third floor and evacuate onto the third floor if you thought that there was a shooter in the building, correct? Of course not. And one final question. When you left your room for the fire alarm, you brought your keys with you, correct? I did. They were on my neck. You're trained to bring your keys out of your classroom and not leave them inside. Correct? It's not really part of training. We have lanyards with keys, and standard procedure is we wear them around our necks. Some teachers wear them in their pockets. But you definitely bring them outside the classroom, or else your kids won't be able to get back into the classroom if you have to go back in, correct? Correct. Okay. I, I thank you for two decades of service for our children. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Based on that, we redirect. No, sir. Okay. No. Is the witness excused? Yes. You may step down. Thank, Thank you. you very much. While she is doing that, state, you may call your next witness. As I uh, told the court in the I was just finished playing the tail end of the video. You want to play the end of F3 of state 6 that you just paused with the witness present? Yes, sir. F4. F4. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brett Troy, to the stand, please. Thanks. Brett Troy.
Sir, if I could have you come all the way up here to the witness stand, please. Once you reach it, but before you have a seat, if you can just stop and look at me, please. Raise your right hand. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do, sir. Please be seated. And sir, once you're seated, if I can get you to scoot that chair all the way up as far as it will go. Can you please state your full name and spell your full name? Detective Brett Schroy, B-R-E-T-T. -T. Last name is S-C-H-R-O-Y. Mr. Clear, you may inquire. Thank you, sir. Uh, detective, can you please tell the jury what you do for a living? Uh, I'm a detective with Coral Springs Police Department. I typically handle financial crimes. How long have you been with the Coral Springs Police Department? Just short of 14 years. Did you have any uh, prior law enforcement service prior to uh, joining Coral Springs? I did not. Did you have any prior military service? I did uh, seven years, uh, both as an enlisted man as, and as an officer. All right. And when you left the service, what was, what was your title? Uh, first Lieutenant. Uh, let me call your attention to the afternoon of February 14, 2018, well, um, approximately 2, 2.15 in the afternoon, maybe a little bit later, right in that time. What were you doing? I was on the second floor of the Coral Springs Police Department in the Detective Bureau. And could you tell us or give us an estimate of how far away the Coral Springs Police Department is from Martin Stone and Douglas High School? I would say probably three to four miles. Were you there by yourself or you... Did you have anyone else with you? Uh, we all have our own separate cubicles, but there was probably a dozen detectives that were in the room at the time. And um, while you were there in the room that afternoon, did anything unusual happen? Uh, a call came out over the radio. It was very benign the way it came out. It was almost like everybody at once stood up in their cubicle and said, wait a minute, what? What, what did they just say? So it was uh, it was very surreal. All right, and what did what did that call cause you to do? Um, that call, um, first of all, Detective Pena, who sits in the cubicle next to me, knowing that my son, um, that my son attended uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, said, "Dude, active shooter at Stoneman Douglas." And I don't particularly remember how I got down several flights of stairs in, into my vehicle. And that, that came over the, uh, your uh, radio, your dispatch? It came through Coral Springs Dispatch, yes. Uh, let me ask you, I, I know it's difficult. Did you know where, at that point, where your son was in high school? No. Um, Building numbers or anything of that nature would not have meant anything to me at that point. Uh, I certainly didn't have my son's schedule memorized. Um, so I, I wouldn't have known if he was in the 1200 building or any other building. And do you know, was he a freshman or sophomore or junior? He was in his 10th grade year. Sophomore. Yeah. So when you got downstairs, what, what, did, you, what did you do then? Uh, I jumped immediately into my car. Some other people were donning their vests, getting their rifles out. Um, I wanted to get there as quickly as I could. Uh, so I just jumped in the car and I went. All right. So uh, would it be correct that you didn't, at that point, uh, put on your vest or, your, uh, or, or get your gun? No, and at that point, uh, I was a fairly new detective and... Uh, Often the cases they give you the rottenest cars that have um, the guns that are in the back in a, in a hard case. So the gun was in the trunk and my vest was on the back seat at the time. All right, and let me ask you, uh, prior to being a detective, what did you do with the Coral, for the Coral, Coral Springs Police Department? I worked both in patrol and I was a bicycle officer. Have you, have you ever been an SRO? I've never been an SRO. Uh, can you tell us how, if you remember how long it took you to get, uh, I, you said about three to four miles, how long it took you to get to uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? It took several minutes to get there. Luckily, the fire department had gotten the call actually a couple minutes before we did, and it actually started to close down intersections, which allowed us to not have to wait for a green light. Uh, but as I approached the school, there were parents in the roadway uh, cars parked in the roadway, 
it took a little bit to get around vehicles to get close to the school. Um, from your son's schedule, were you aware when school was slated to end um, during the week? What, what time school would end on a daily basis? Like uh, 2.30, 3 o'clock, somewhere in that nature. Somewhere yeah. in that area? Yeah, somewhere in that area. All right, and um, if you recall, do you know what time it was uh, when you arrived at Martha Stone and Douglas High School? Absolutely not. Um, it, it's difficult. Um, there was a lot of things going through my brain as I was driving, uh, what I was going to do, uh, whether I was going to try to go attempt to find my son, if I was going to go attempt to uh, locate the shooter and kind of address the shooter and by addressing the shooter, you know, save everybody while saving my son. So I, I wasn't thinking about time. I was just thinking about getting there, getting out, getting my equipment and addressing the threat. And you said you, things were going through your mind. Um, was there, a, a, in your mind, any question as to whether you were going to save your son or whether you were going to get, go after the shooter? Within a few seconds, I had determined the best course of action was to save him by saving everybody else. So, Did there come a time later on that you realized about what time you had arrived at school? I've been told um, I arrived about 10 minutes after the last shot. So uh, at what part of the campus did you actually, uh, or let me put it this way, excuse me, strike that. Uh, in what area of the campus did you leave your vehicle? Uh, there's a scrolling sign that's kind of the uh, middle, uh, uh, let's say, southeast corner of the campus, a scrolling sign that does announcements for basketball games or dances or whatever, and that's kind of where I parked. Um, there's reasons that I did that. I saw there was a large amount of vehicles that were parked on the northeast corner. I kind of assumed that's where the problem was, but as I had stated uh, at that point, I, I neither had my vest nor my rifle. All right. Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you. Um, what it was, it's it, um, defense F for identification. Excuse me, Madam Reporter. Um, if you could just point out for the jury, um, if you recognize, if you recognize this map, um, where you you saw you said there was a lot of traffic in one corner of the school. Yeah, the the majority of the traffic was up in here, uh, in this area. Okay, near so, Pine Island and. In Holbrook. Okay. So there's a scrolling sign somewhere in this neighborhood. Again, there was cars parked all over the place. It kind of limited my ability to um, to really pick a good spot. So I just kind of rolled to a spot, jumped out, and started to uh, get my equipment out. Okay. Thank you. All right. So when you say um, you got your equipment out, can you further explain to the jury what you're talking about? Um, we're all issued a vest. Um, as a detective, you can imagine I'm, I'm upstairs. The cases come to me. I'm not dealing with the public. I'm not dealing with the bad guy. So our vest is kept typically inside our vehicle. When we go to a hot call, we would throw that vest on. So that vest was behind me in my back seat. Uh, I had mentioned previously, um, if you look in police cars, a lot of times the guys can grab the rifle right above them. It's in a rack. They press a button. They can pull the rifle out. Uh, because I was in an older car, my, uh, my rifle was in a lockable box, which is in the trunk of my car. So I had to get it out that way. Okay. And where was the vest located? Uh, behind me in the back seat. All right. Um, when earlier, before you became a detective, you were on road patrol and bicycle patrol, would you wear your vest all the time? 100% of the time. And why would you do that? You just never know uh, what's going to happen. So it's it's better to have it on and not need it than to need it and not have it on. Uh, a minute ago, you said um, a hot call. Is that, am I correct? Yes. Can you explain what you mean by a hot call? Uh, one that I guess there would be an element of danger. It's, it's not uncommon for me to go and interview people without a vest. 
you know, it's kind of this calm down situation where I'm not talking to a suspect. Um, under those circumstances, I might not put on a vest, but this is certainly one that a vest is necessary. Okay. So um, you leave your car at that location? Yes, I did. All right. And where do you go? Uh, initially, I wanted to go towards where the majority uh, of the cars had been formed up in that northeast corner. Uh, but almost immediately when I grabbed my rifle out, uh, Sergeant DeRosa, who's at that time was in uh, the detective bureau, grabbed me and said, hey, you're with me. So uh, we didn't know where the shooter was. It was his idea um, to start forming teams to start searching. Right. In, in the chain of command, it's, if he's a sergeant, is he above? He is. He yes. Is. Okay. Yep. So you follow his directive? Yes, I did. And I just wanted to make sure when you say there was a lot of cars up at the northeast corner, that wasn't just police vehicles. It was a mix of vehicles? It was a mixture of uh, police cruisers from different agencies. It was unmarked cars. It was parents' cars. It was, um, it was kind of chaos in terms of people walking around in the street, uh, uh, parents, I'm sure, that were you know, upset and wanted to know what was going on with their kids. So it was just a lot of traffic. All right. Up until this point, when, when, when you uh, joined forces, so to speak, with Sergeant DeRosa, had you heard any shots being fired? At no point while I was on campus did I hear a shot fired. All right. And at that point, had I don't know if you had time to check, had you heard from your son at that point? No. I had tried multiple times mm -hmm. to get in contact with my son. Uh, when I would dial his number, it wouldn't even ring. And I, I would chalk that up to the amount of traffic and the amount of people that were trying to do the same exact thing. Okay. Where uh, do you and Sergeant DeRosa go? Initially, we tried to uh, gain access to the campus. There's a gate almost directly west uh, of where uh, I got out of my car. That was locked and chained. So we ended up going to the main, uh, the main entrance and banging on the doors, getting the attention of a deputy that was inside the administration building, and they let us in. Okay. So, that, your knowledge that was the administration building? To my knowledge, it was, yeah. Were you aware whether that building had a number or, or not? No, and again, even to this day, I'm not sure that uh, outside of one or two buildings, I could tell you what buildings were what numbers. All right. So, what happens when you go up to the administration building? Well, uh, we, because we didn't know where the shooter was, um, as I had mentioned, the idea was to just start clearing until we got more information. So uh, the, the, there is an auditorium that was right there. So the first thing that we did was clear the auditorium. All right, let me ask you, um, because I, I don't want to get too confusing. I'm going to put that map up again. Do you think you'd be able to identify at least from looking at the map? I think so. Right? Yeah, oh. I think so. Yeah. You Thank you, Again, this is uh, what's been marked as State uh, Defense app for identification. Again, I'm sorry, Madam Court Reporter. May the witness step down sure. to do the identification. All right, if you could just show the jury. Um, I've got this right here. This is where I came in, so. All right. Initially, we, we tried to get into a gate that was about right here. Okay. I don't know if you all can see that. I'm sure. Uh, it was it located about here, ultimately? We came in through this area. I'm going to assume that this was the auditorium right here. Okay. And so this is where you go to clear? Yeah, this is this is the building that we ended up clearing initially. All right. Great. Could you please explain to the jury what you mean by the word clear? Um, the auditorium was locked. I ran into an administrator that was outside. He was able to unlock uh, the auditorium. I stuck my head inside. I kind of looked at my hard corners. There was a bunch of students that were in the middle of the auditorium. I called out to them, has anyone seen or heard the shooter? And several of them said no. So at that point, I backed out. I had the administrator lock the door, and I physically went into the bathroom, each stall, to make sure that somebody wasn't hiding inside the bathroom. Right, so what, is it fair then to say by clearing you're, you're not actually clearing people out of the building. No. You're doing what? I'm actually just asking questions. Obviously, I don't want to 
force people out of the room, out into the parking lot, or, or into some other area of the school where they might actually get shot. They're actually safer staying exactly where they were. But in by using the word clearing, what I'm saying is clearing for the suspect. Okay, so you clear, your, you're in your mind, these kids are safe, there's nobody in there who's going to shoot at this. Right. So after, the, was there any incident after you finished clearing the bathrooms that happened? We had received um, uh, intelligence over the radio, on the Coral Springs radio, that the subject uh, was dressed in black pants and a red shirt. Uh, when I finished clearing the bathrooms, I noticed that there was a door that led to the theater. There was a spiral staircase that led to the top of the theater. I went to the top of the theater and a subject that was dressed in black pants and a uh, red shirt was actually hiding in the dark. Um, so I ordered them out. We took them downstairs. The person was cuffed and then escorted away from the scene and I didn't see that person again. And I, I'm presuming that while you're going and getting this person out because he's, got, he's wearing something that matches what you had heard, uh, you've got your gun out. Oh, yes. And being uh, extraordinarily careful and right. uh, handling that person. That's correct. Did you ever find out whether he was a suspect? Oh, obviously, it learned later on. It was just a student that was trying to hide, and that was a good place to hide. So it wasn't the person that we were looking for. But we never know. Uh, I wouldn't, you wouldn't know if you're in a situation like that and you find somebody huddled in the dark. So that's why he was uh, detained. And later cleared. All right, so um, is Sergeant DeRosa still with you? He is. I don't think he came to the top of the stairs. The stairs are quite narrow. Uh, he was there when I brought the subject back down. Okay. So once the subject's taken care of, what do you and Sergeant DeRosa decide to do? Uh, while this is going on, we had also received intelligence that... Um, there were, there, were wound, there were wounded subjects at the 1200 building, which really didn't mean anything to me. I didn't know what the 1200 building was, even though my son attended. But when they said the three-story building, that keyed into me. And at that point, we, uh, Sergeant DeRosa and myself started moving down the hallway towards uh, the 1200 building. So, again, I want to make sure we have this right, that even though your son attends the school, just the name, 1200 building, that didn't mean anything. It didn't at that point, no. Okay, but when you heard three-story, right. that clicked in. Right, because that's the only three-story building. I believe he also said northeast corner as part of his uh, transmission. All right. So at that point, then, you um, you begin... Uh, let me, let, well, let me ask you this. Uh, we talked about a little earlier that by the time you arrived at the school, the shooting had been over for, uh, let's say, 10 minutes, I believe you said? Yes, now some more time has obviously gone by. You've cleared the auditorium and you've taken care of the suspect. How much time now would you estimate has elapsed if you added on to that 10 minutes? I'd say another 10 or 12 minutes at least. Okay, so give or take 20 to 22 minutes uh, since the shooting ended. Correct. All right, so what happens next then with, uh, as, you, as you go, um, if I've got it right, north? North, We're going north through the hallway, um, passing the 700 building, approaching the 1200 building that I can see across uh, a grassy area. Uh, I, inc I encountered uh, the person that I knew as the SRO. I would, did not know his name, but I did recognize him. And how did you? How were you able to recognize him? From, just from attending sporting events and that type of stuff. Um, it. It wouldn't have made sense for me to ask my son, who's your SRO? You know, I'm a cop myself, um, so I just I just recognized him from being around the area on previous sporting events. Okay, football games, whatnot. Right, right. Now, just before you said that you saw the SRO, you said, I was able to see ahead. Were you able, did you have a, a clear view of the east end, what, what now is the three-story building? Yes, I did. Building? Yeah. What were you able to see, if anything, there? Uh, at that point, there was already people making entrance uh, from uh, the East End. Uh, cops were already making entrance. Students were 
were exiting the building at that point. Okay, so when you say people entering, you mean law enforcement? Law enforcement. Okay. Were you able to tell if that was uh, Broward Sheriff's Office or Coral Springs or a combination? There? I think it was a mixture of both, you know. Is there a difference in uniforms between what BSO wears and what uh, Coral Springs wears? Absolutely. Um, the gentlemen that are uh, on the side over there are dressed in the BSO uniforms, which are typically dark green, whereas Coral Springs is dark blue. Right. And today you are wearing a Coral Springs uniform? I am wearing Coral Springs uniform. All right. And it is... Best I can tell, dark blue. Dark blue. Okay. Dark blue or black. You take right. take your choice. All right. Um, all right. So you're able to see that uh, law enforcement is entering the building, and also that students are being extracted from the building. That's correct. All right. Do you speak with? Uh, now I know you said you didn't know his name, but you knew him to be the SRO. Did you speak with the SRO at that point? I did. Um, I ran. I ran up to him. Uh, and I had to pause, I had to wait. Uh, he was either speaking on the radio or attempting to speak on the radio when I first went up to him. All right. And let me ask, when, when you first went up to him, did you take any type of a, uh, let's say, tactical position? Did, were you, your, your body, were right. you standing up straight or were you doing something else? You no, know, I, I, as I recall, it was kind of like a crouched position, like, Hey, I'm not really sure about walking out into this open area. I'm trying to make myself, I'm, I'm kind of tall to begin with, so I was trying to make myself a little bit smaller, not knowing where the shooter actually was. Could the officer please, uh, I'm sorry, the detective step down for a moment and just show the sure. jury what type of position you were, where you were in? Uh, holding a rifle either in my right or my left hand. It would be kind of like this, make myself small type of, of thing, just to get within earshot of him so I could ask him a question. And how tall are you, sir? Six two. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now, I believe you said the reason for that was because, well, let me scratch it. Let me ask you. During that time period when you left uh, the auditorium and had secured the, the subject that you had found hiding up there uh, until the time that you spoke with, uh, the SRO, had you heard any shots go off? No, no shots. Okay. So tell us now what, what you, you had said that the, the, the SRO seemed to be very busy, correct? He seemed very busy. He seemed very agitated, obviously. Um, I waited to what I thought there was a pause and uh, recognizing that he's the SRO. He's been there the whole time. Uh, he would be the most knowledgeable about the location of the shooter. I asked very simply, where is the shooter? And did he respond? He did. He pointed at the 1200 building and said he's on the third floor. So other than what you had heard earlier, this is the first in real-time intelligence that you're receiving? Yes. Did you have any knowledge of where, obviously the SRO is telling you that, do you have any knowledge or know where that he was getting that from? Did he sell, tell you that? Uh, I, I didn't want to burden him with a bunch of questions. I okay. felt he was the most knowledgeable, so when he told me that, I took that at face value and, and backed away. Okay. So I'm, I want to make sure we have the picture clear. In your mind, from that intelligence, you are believing that there's a shooter, not necessarily firing, but a shooter inside the 1200 building on the third floor. That's correct. And you've also, as you testified, you've already seen uh, Coral Springs and maybe other uh, agencies entering from the east end of the 1200 building, right? That's correct. All right. So what, do, what, what then do you do? I was trying to think to myself, how can I be most useful? Uh, I knew that entry had already been made uh, to the building. Uh, about that time, uh, a radio transmission had come across Coral Springs, Maine, saying that he had shot the windows out. Um, so, who had? Who did you take that to mean? Had shot the windows. Out? The shooter, which you know later we found out was was Cruz. But you know at that point we didn't have an an ID on the subject. So, my assumption was that the shooter had shot out the window. Uh, Did you know 
I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah. I'm trying to get through it step by step here. And so forgive me for interrupting, but did you know where those windows were that supposedly were shot out? I don't think they had said at any point, you know, the third third floor windows, second from the left or anything like that. It was just that windows had been shot out. Okay. All right. Um, again, sorry to interrupt. Go yeah. ahead. So I was trying. I I was trying to think to myself, how could I be most useful? I had mentioned you didn't want to have too many officers going into the building, uh, particularly from both sides, because you have a crossfire type of situation. Can um, you explain that just a little more? In sure. Um, if you can think about a building and there being access on both ends, if the bad guy was in the middle and did something that would uh, require us to shoot at him, we'd be, uh, both sides would be shooting at the subject and in effect shooting at each other. Okay. So that's, that's what I mean by crossfire. Right. Needs to be avoided. Right. That needs to be avoided. Okay. And then you did what? So uh, Sergeant DeRosa and I had a quick meeting. We talked about uh, the fact that it, it's possible that he could be uh, using those windows to shoot at first responders as they're coming into the building. Uh, I looked to my south. There was uh, the 700 building. There was a exterior staircase. Uh, we cleared our way to the top of the staircase. My idea was I would be able to watch the building from that elevated position. If uh, the shooter was to shoot at first responders, I would be able to shoot back and I'm going to keep him stop from you. doing it. Couple of questions lined up on sure. what you just said. Um, if you can tell us approximately when you go up to the second floor of the 700 building, which I'm presuming is the north side because you're yes. the south side of the 1200 yes. building, how far are you from the 1200 building? Uh, 30, 40 yards, maybe. Okay. And where is the SRO in relation to you? when you're going up that stairwell to get up to the second floor? He's still in that same position that, that I had left him, which is kind of between the 700 building and the 1200 building. All right, but is he in a, uh, is he out in the open or is he sort of in a, a somewhat enclosed area? He's in the open. It, it kind of struck me strange that he was not adopting that same idea that I was, that it was kind of bent over as I, made movements to try to make myself small. Uh, you, you testified that you've seen the SRO at, at, at football games. Um, is he a tall gentleman? I'd say he's at least as tall as I am. All right. And um, can you describe as far as his physical position, you know, whether he you just said it wasn't bent sort of down like you were? Yeah. Was he standing up straight? He was. The whole time? Yes. Uh, did he have his gun? Um, out as I recall, he, he did have his pistol out and had a radio in the other hand. And do you recall what type of uh, pistol that was? I believe that BSOs issued Glocks, I believe. So you get up to the, you climb up to the second level of the 700 building, or the classrooms, do they face, is there an interior, do you know if there's an interior corridor or the classrooms face out onto the... You're talking about the 700 yeah. building? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. When you get upstairs, what do you do? Is uh, Sergeant DeRosa still with you? He's still with me, okay. yeah. What, what do you do when you get upstairs? So I found kind of a platform to rest my rifle on. I kind of took a deep breath, and I'm looking at all the windows from east to west, and it, in almost every window, the blinds were moving in every window. Um, I, I think I had made a comment uh, to Sergeant DeRosa, you know, this is this is impossible. Like, I can't see through the window. Uh, when I heard the report that the window had shot out and been shot out, in my mind, I was thinking of the window completely being missing. Obviously, if it has bullet holes in it, you can't shoot through the window or you can't put a gun through the window. So... As I'm looking, I didn't see that situation. I did see some windows that had some bullet holes in it, but I didn't see uh, that there was a window completely broken out. So in your mind, there's a difference then between maybe what was said over the um, over dispatch versus what you're actually seeing in that there's no 
window broken out. No, Correct. Just no right. glass at all. Shot versus shot out. Yeah. Okay. So right. one being completely right. gone, glass completely gone. The other glass still in place, but shattered, maybe spider webs, right. and glass, whatnot. Correct. Right. You already you stated you're at a, a distance of I think you said forty or some odd yards from the twelve hundred building. You see those blinds. Did you any reason in your head why those blinds might be moving? I thought that the blinds could be moving because the students were in there. I thought this, uh, the blinds could be moving because the officers that had made entry were moving the blinds. Uh, of course, there's always that possibility that it could have been the shooter that was moving the blinds. But without knowing who was who, any attempt on my part to shoot at the shooter, I don't know what was beyond him. So I could have been shooting students. I could have been shooting other officers. So I quickly concluded that I needed to find a different job, that that wasn't going to get it done. Okay. Well, let me... Let me ask you though before we move on. Um, the distance was that that was was that a factor in why you could not see in those windows? Uh, it, it's it was very light outside and very dark inside the building, and I believe that there's also tint on the windows as well as the the blinds, so you just couldn't see inside. So, and, and you're again, you're not up against the window, sort of cupping your no. hands over your eyes and stop the glare and looking in the window. Correct. You're, you're back. You're in the 700. Correct. All right. So just not possible for you to be able to tell what's behind those windows. That's correct. Okay. So when you make that decision that the, the tactical position that you took was not helpful, in your opinion, what, what did you do that? What did you do that? I said to Sergeant DeRosa, let's let's go over to the 1200 building, uh, you know, either uh, start to help rescue kids or we'll help to clear the building, whatever we can do. We need to be more useful than what we're doing right now. Okay. And what did you, so in order to accomplish that, what did you do? We ran from, well, we uh, came down the stairs and we ran across that open area. Uh, and we ended up settling at the east side of the 1200 building. All right. And at that time that you ran over to the east end of the 1200 building, had the SRO moved from his initial position where you had seen him? No, I believe he was where we had first, um, where we had first seen him. Let me ask you, as you're running across... The, it's, it's an open area, correct? From the 12, 700 to the 1200 building? Yes. Were you worried about sniper fire? I had, I had mentioned earlier, you know, I'm fairly tall, so I tried to make myself small. So obviously it was in my mind, but up until that point, I had never heard a shot fired since I had been on the campus. What? what? You hadn't heard a shot fired? Uh, what would have had to have happened? For you to have thought there was sniper fire, I suppose there would have been uh, bullets kicking up dirt around where I'm standing. Uh, bullets would have been bouncing off the building behind me. That audible crack as uh, as a round passes over my head. Some of those things would lead you to believe that you're being shot at. Did you learn that from your police training or your military training or a combination of both? Kind of combination of both. So would it be fair to say at that point, you were not at all uh, concerned about sniper fire, even though you had to be worried about the broken window? Yeah, uh, I wasn't worried about sniper fire at that point. All right. So when you make it over to the east end of the 1200 building, what happens then? Uh, there was a number of deputies and officers. Uh, I saw... Officer Capri, who I had uh, worked in the bike unit with, with uh, I, I wanted to get in the fight. I grabbed him by the collar and I said, come on with me, we're going in. And um, I'm going to be, I'm going to have to stop you there because I want to know why you want to do that. What do you think is causing you to do, I, you to say, I want to go in. 
I think it's a <clears throat> It's a combination of things. It's uh, wanting, wanting to save my son, wanting to save other people's sons and daughters. It's what we signed up to do. It was our Super Bowl. You could say, if if you weren't if you weren't ready for that day, when would you be ready? How did the information that the SRO had relayed to you figure into that decision that you wanted to go in? Can you restate? Earlier you told us that when Bonnie talked to the SRO, you didn't want to bother him, then you talked to him. Yeah. He had told you, can you tell us again, what did he tell you? He pointed at the 1200 building and said, he's on the third floor. Okay. So... How did that figure into why you want to go into the building? I figured this was the opportunity to put this to an end. What happens next? Uh, I had grabbed uh, Officer Capri by the by the back of the collar, and I said, um, "This was somebody that I trusted. It's a good friend of mine." And I wanted to get in there. And I said, come on, let's go. And Sergeant DeRosa heard what I said, and he grabbed a hold of me and said, no, they're making entry from the west side. I don't want crossfire. So we stayed at the, at the base of the steps that, that on the east side of the 1200 building. Okay, so at that point now you know that law enforcement has entered the 1200 building from the far side, the west side of the building. Correct. Right? Okay. And in your head at this point, the shooter is up on the third floor? Correct. Okay. So you are now where? Are you inside the building at this point? I started off kind of inside inside the stairwell um, after I, I got rebuked and told, no, we're not going inside. Uh, I came outside and was kind of standing at the corner of the building trying to keep an eye on windows, trying to find something to do that would make me valuable. How did you get rebuked? What, 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 what I mean is when Sergeant DeRosa said, no, you're not going in. Um, we're going in, you know, they're going in on the west side. So oh, it's kind of like, stop what you're doing. Okay, you know? because right. does that relate back to what you told us earlier about you don't want crossfire blue? That's correct. Room? Okay, yeah, officers that's correct. possibly injuring other officers correct. on the same floor. Okay, right. makes sense. Right. So, again, then what happened next? So, uh, it was being relayed to us that um, the shooter had thrown his rifle down, had taken off his gas mask, and was walking down the stairs. What is your response to that information? I basically ran inside, got at the base of the steps, and I thought, okay, here it is. This is, this is why I'm here. So now you are inside the building. I'm inside the building. Are you inside on the first floor, or are you in the stairwell? Do you remember? Um, I'm on. I'm in the. I'm at the base of the stairwell, which is kind of separated from the rest of the first floor. That's the east stairwell. Right? The east stairwell. And what happens at that point? Uh, we're waiting. We're waiting, and then all of a sudden they tell us uh, he's out on the ground. He's running west. Yeah. Describe for us what kind of effect that had on you. It, it actually, it, it kind of scrambled my brain because I thought, how in the world did this person get past us? You're waiting for him to come down that stairwell and you're, you're waiting to kill him. Yes. All right. And all of a sudden now, the information has changed. The information changed. <laughs> What does that cause you to do? I know he's running westbound. So I ran out the door and people followed me and we started running uh, parallel to the 1200 building. And I'm focusing uh, my rifle westbound towards uh, the middle school. And we're uh, 
at the end of the 1200 building, I looked to the right and Coach Feiss uh, had been shot and was laying on the ground. I didn't know Feiss at that point, but that was a gentleman that was laying there. Um, we kept moving westbound, checking every nook and cranny, every bush, every small building, every corner, uh, almost to the Walmart. All right. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Um, I want to go back for a moment to that time where you decide to make the run from the 700 building to the east end of the 1200 building. Yes. That's sort of a reconfiguration of your thinking? Mm -hmm. All right. So in the situation as you're running across, all of a sudden shots are fired. You don't know where those shots are coming from. Would that cause a reconfiguration of your thinking? I would think that the safest spot would be as tight against the 1200 building as possible. So I would probably keep on running until I got to the 1200 building. All right. And how long would, we're talking about this thinking, the reconfiguration, because now things have changed, right? Yeah. Situations change. You, you turn it down, no sniper fire, but now you just heard gunfire. How long, in your estimate, would you stay there in that position, reconfiguring? I'd say a maximum of five or six seconds trying to figure out where the shot's coming from. Um, even if, even if this, you said a sniper, this is a sniper scenario? Is no, that what you're saying? you had eliminated the sniper. Okay, so it's so just shots fired. That. That's out of the, you okay. can already describe to the jury how you would have known a sniper scenario. Okay. That's out of the picture. Okay, so if it's just standard shots, I can imagine five or six seconds trying to figure out where the shots are coming from and then moving to where the gunfire is coming from. Um, you know, the idea is the longer it takes for us to get to the shooter, every time the shot is fired, that's a kid being killed. All right. So you would stop for a moment to figure it out, but you wouldn't stay put, correct? It's reasonable to, you know, five or six seconds to try to figure out, you know, where the shots are coming from before, yeah. And then keep on moving. And you got to keep moving. Sound. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so I kind of, Interrupted you again. I've been doing that a lot today, I guess, and I do apologize. Uh, you had made it over to the west side of the um, 1200 building. Um, did there ever come a time that day that you saw any windows in that 1200 bill in the 1200 building completely shot out? No, there was never any windows that were shot out, just shot. And did you come to learn that later on? Or uh, you, or yeah, obviously, I, I didn't do an investigation of the whole building to see that. Um, they hadn't been shot out, but I'm told that none were actually shot out. Because at this point, you're trying to find the shooter. He's supposedly has exited and he's out there right. going right. westbound. Right. So my focus wasn't on the building. It was rather uh, between the building and the middle school. Okay. So for the remainder of that day, can you tell the jury what you did? Briefly. Uh, when we almost reached the Walmart uh, we were notified that the people were, that were communicating the intelligence were watching video that was 20 minutes old. So when we thought we were chasing Cruz uh, across the field, he had departed that location 20 minutes previously. So he wasn't actually there. So the rest of the time that I spent was going back because you're never sure if there's another shooter or if that information was correct. We went back and I started going classroom by classroom, uh, physically removing that class and escorting them to the parking lots. And was that in uh, buildings other than the 1200 building? Yes, it was everywhere but the 1200 building. Okay. Yeah. And finally, uh, Detective, um, did there come a time that day when you saw your son? Yeah. <clears throat> when I got to the 1200 building, I had kind of given up on trying to call him. I had called him about 10 times and he actually called me. He was in the southeast corner of the campus and he was huddled um, with some other students, but at least I knew he was okay. Um, it wasn't until 
very, very late that his building was the one that was actually released and escorted out to uh, to the parking lot. So I saw him very, very late. Very late that afternoon or early evening? Yes. Thank you very much, Detective. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a quick restroom break, and then we'll proceed with the cross-examination of the witness. Same admonition as always. Please don't discuss the facts of the case, the evidence, the witnesses, or the testimony amongst yourselves or anyone else. If you'll leave the notepads in your chairs and step in the back one moment, I'll be right back with you. Thank you. Okay, we're outside the presence of the jury. Everyone can be seated. Uh, real quick, five-minute restroom break. Sir, if you're comfortable, you can stay right there. Okay, sir. If you want to step down, I just can't have you talk to anyone about your testimony. And we'll yes, be sir. right back as soon as they're back. Okay? Yes, sir. That wraps up segment number three in our coverage of the trial of Scott Peterson. There is more to come. I'm Tony Bruschi. Press subscribe so you don't miss any of our coverage. This has been a special report from True Crime Today and the Hidden Killers podcast. 